welcome everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, I'm Max Katz. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about uh, the A100 GPU that is now available at uh, Theta GPU on at uh, Argon and soon Promutter at uh, NERSC. Promutter is already there and is uh, being uh, made ready for users right now. So hopefully, if you don't already have A100 access today, you'll have it pretty soon. So I want to let you know what it is that you're getting in this new GPU. Now I will say up front that this is, I'm sure, a diverse audience, and it is therefore hard for me to um, say something that will be uniformly interesting to everyone. I'm sure that between you, there are data scientists and machine learning engineers and you know, scientific HPC people. And so it's hard for me to give a talk that um, says everything that's interesting to everyone. And I tried to give a, a kind of selection of greatest hits of what is interesting about A100. But if I don't say something that you're interested in, please just let me know. You can interrupt me or, or say something in the chat. And I'm happy to discuss it. Uh, and I'll take questions at the end for topics that I didn't hit. OK, so um, the motivation in uh, what's driving NVIDIA's new GPU architecture is, is fundamentally that the problem sizes that we are tackling as a scientific community are um, growing uh, quite precipitously. And in particular, this is true in data science, visualization, machine learning, where the data sets that we're operating on are, are, are large and going all the time. And you can quantify that either in terms of like how much data we're processing, or in the case of neural networks, you know how many parameters they are, how many floating point operations you need to do to train them. And we're seeing that there's really exponential growth, uh, especially in machine learning, and in particular, an exponential growth that you know outpaces more than uh, traditionally. And so um, the driving force between, behind the new architectures that NVIDIA generates is really how do we cope with uh, these new problems that require massive amounts of data to process and large models to process them. So A100 is NVIDIA's top of the line uh, GPU for data science, machine learning, uh, and HPC. It um, has several flavors. Uh, I will only talk about the one that is in um, Theta GPU and Promutter, which is the A100 40 gigabyte SXM form factor GPU. So this is a server class GPU. It has 40 gigabytes of DRAM uh, memory, uh, that's high bandwidth memory, that delivers over 1.5 terabytes per second worth of bandwidth. Um, it has uh, tensor cores like the last couple NVIDIA GPU architectures, but there's a, a new generation of tensor cores that have expanded capability and performance. Um, higher throughput uh, off the GPU with NVLink, and also new functionality called uh, multi-instance GPU, which allows us to split the GPU into several isolated segments for uh, certain workloads where that makes sense. The other variants include an 80 gigabyte uh, memory uh, component, as well as a PCIe-based version of this uh, for more kind of off-the-shelf deployment servers. Um, but the uh, SXM form factor is the one that's uh, deployed in places like Perlmutter and Theta GPU, so that's what I'll talk about. A100 is designed to provide substantial performance improvements in both um, artificial intelligence slash machine learning and also HPC. Now, in AI, one thing that was traditionally true of NVIDIA architectures is that we kind of had one product line for deep learning training and then another product line for deep learning inference. And that's still true today, right? So if, you, if your workload is primarily deep learning inference, then we have GPUs that are targeted for that and you have um, deep learning training as your primary workload, then we have GPUs that are better suited for that. But with A100, one of our goals was to make it a, an excellent piece of hardware for both AI training and AI inference. And so if you look at training and inference of PERT um, in, in the AI space, what we see is that relative to V100, we get um, 6x improvements on FP32 or 3x in FP16 training, uh, and also uh, up to 7x improvement in, in inference throughput uh, compared to V100. And one of the ways that we achieve that is by, or, or one, one way of thinking about it, I should say, is that in A100, you can split the GPU into seven independent GPU instances, and I will talk about this functionality in a little bit. Um, but the, the inference throughput of just one of those slices is comparable on this workload uh, for V100, and then you can have seven of them put together on a GPU to have up to 7x the inference throughput. And so we really strove to make A100 excellent for both deep learning training and deep learning inference. 
In the H3C space, uh, what we see is a, a substantial improvement relative to, D1, to V100 uh, across a range of um, HPC application spaces. You know, V100, of course, is the GPU that powers Summit and Sierra and a number of other GPU-powered supercomputers today. And probably for those of you who have used GPUs before, it's kind of the, your workhorse GPU today. So this gives you a sense of what kind of speedups are possible depending on what your application domain is. We typically see 1.5 to 1.7x improvements for applications that are more like uh, DRAM bandwidth bound. And so there are some examples of that on the left uh, for some molecular dynamics workloads. Um, there are also workloads that are more compute bound. I and mean, we see uh, improvements as large as 2x on, on those uh, HPC applications. And so you can get a pretty good you know, 1.6 to 1.7x uh, average speed up um, relative to 100. And this was at launch. Um, I want to emphasize that we work hard over time to improve the performance of key HPC applications on NVIDIA's architecture. And so historically, what we've seen is that the performance at launch um, was uh, improved on over time. Uh, and so, you know, the average application performance on V100 today is significantly faster than it was on V100 launch. And um, I think we're already seeing some indication of that today, uh, almost a year after A100 has launched. Um, a little bit about the specifications and how, to, how it compares to the previous GPU V100. Um, I'll talk about this in a moment, but for those of you who are um, unfamiliar with the uh, GPU architecture, the way that we do it, uh, the way that we construct a GPU is by uh, building individual components called st streaming multiprocessors, or SMs, and then tiling a bunch of them across a GPU. Um, and generally speaking, the way that we add more performance over time is that we make the GPU wider, right? That's really the key insight as to what makes a GPU a GPU <clears throat> is that, and of course, we work on making the individual compute components faster and more efficient, uh, but a big chunk of delivered per performance improvement over time comes from just having more parallelism. And so we've improved the number of SMs from 80 to 108 and view to A100. Um, tensor cores have also been uh, substantially improved in what they could do. So the fundamental unit of arithmetic in the V100 tensor core was FP16. We have now expanded it to a range of different uh, mathematical precisions in A100, and I've listed them there. The um, cache space available on uh, A100 is significantly larger than on V100, both in L1 cache and in L2 cache. And I will comment that uh, this is a, a pretty important effect for many HPC workloads because, you know, a lot of HPC workloads have some component, which is just, you know, memory bandwidth bound, like copying arrays from one to the other. But then there are plenty of, of HPC applications that have workloads with large local memory requirements, like large stack frames and that sort of thing. And the relatively small cache that's available on GPUs relative to CPUs can make those applications hard. And while applications should strive to reduce their local memory requirements with, if, if possible, when running on GPUs, uh, we do work hard from generation to generation to improve the performance and capacity of our caches. And so um, you can see, you know, nearly a 7x uh, cache size improvement in L2 cache from uh, V100 to A100 as an example of, of how we're working on this. Uh, memory bandwidth uh, improved by something like 70% from 900 gigabytes a second to 1555, as you can see there. We've doubled the uh, NV length throughput coming off the GPU um, for GPU to GPU communication. Um, you can see there also at the bottom the uh, performance improvement in um, FP64 and FP32. And in particular, um, one thing that we um, did in A100 that's especially relevant to uh, the HPC audience is that we added FP64 computation to tensor cores for the first time. And so you can get a, a 2x improvement in um, tensor core uh, in FP64 throughput if your workload can take advantage of matrix multiplication on tensor cores. Uh, we've also added a new format called TF32 or TensorFloat32, uh, which I will talk about momentarily, which can give you substantial improvement uh, in 32 bit calculations if uh, they're appropriate to you. So this is what uh, a GPU looks like. For those of you who haven't seen a block diagram before, um, I mentioned that the way that we lay out our GPUs is that we have these individual SMs, and so they're almost so small that you can't see them here. But um, 
we have these individual SMs, uh, and then we have 108 of them uh, tiled across the GPU. Each one of them is the same, and then the parallelism uh, effect comes from spreading work, parallelizing work across many of these SMs. Um, and so uh, because there's 108 of these, and each of these has very wide vector lanes is one way to think of it, you need massive parallelism to fill in A100, um, even more so than V100, but applications that can take advantage of it can get a substantial improvement as a result. Um, we have improved uh, L2 cache substantially, as I mentioned, 6.7x relative to V100, and 1.7x uh, improvement in DRAM bandwidth on A100. Now, if you dive into one of these particular SMs, uh, streaming multiprocessors, this is what you get under the hood. <clears throat> and so uh, each of these SMs has 32, um, uh, I'm sorry, 64 FP32 units or 32 FP64 units. So about a 2x uh, difference in performance for FP32 for FP64. That's been true, by the way, for pretty much every recent NVIDIA GPU generation for the high-end you know, scientific GPUs. Um, similar number of uh, individual cores for M32 versus FP32, and then these third generation tensor cores. Um, there are some substantial improvements in what's available in our newest generation of tensor cores, which I will talk about. But I also wanna emphasize that we've made other improvements to the SM architecture itself, such as the ability to support asynchronous copies uh, from memory into shared memory, and also, like I mentioned, the increased capacity of the unified L1 slash shared memory cache. So what in tensor cores? Well, I mentioned that one thing that's new is they support FP64, but the nice thing about FP64 math is it just kind of works out of the box. So I, don't, I won't really say too much about that because the goal is that you just do an FP64 um, matrix multiply, for example, using Kublas, and it gets 2x faster compared to the same, uh, what it would be uh, using only um, standard FMA arithmetic, and it would be 2.5x faster than V100 doing the same problem. Because again, V100 only had FMA instructions for matrix multiplication in 64-bit arithmetic. TensorFlow 32 is a new format we've created um, that addresses uh, a fairly wide range of problems uh, in deep learning and also in, in some HPC uh, cases possibly. The idea of TensorFlow 32 comes from the following observation. If you compare FP32 and FP16 arithmetic, which are the first and third rows here, there's a couple differences, right? One, of course, is that FP32 has um, a much higher precision than FP16, so 23 bits of precision compared to 10 bits of precision. And also, FP32 has a wider range than FP16. But there's a certain class of problems where you want the higher dynamic range, like the, the largest possible number that you can represent of FP32, but you don't need all that precision. And so TensorFlow 32 is a compromise uh, arith um, arithmetic um, um, form where you have the range of FP32, but the precision of FP16. So for some problems, this is the kind of the best of the both worlds thing, where you don't need that much precision to represent your number, but you do need to represent relatively large numbers uh, in magnitude, and so TensorFlow 32 can support that. Uh, and that can be key for some workloads, uh, for example, in some deep learning workloads where just the size of the number that you can get in FP16 doesn't quite cut it. And so for those workloads where that's true, TF32 can be a great uh, solution. Also, we've added support for bfloat16, uh, which is a popular format uh, that has uh, been growing in, in influence over the last few years, which has um, the range of FP32, but um, uh, again, even smaller uh, precision. And so this 16-bit format is also pretty popular in some cases and is supported by our tensor cores. And so what does this look like in terms of delivered throughput? Well, on the right, I have um, a comparison of doing large matrix multiplications with Kublas, um, comparing A100 using the tensor cores uh, against V100. And what we see is consistently about a, um, a over 2x improvement um, on A100 to V100, again, because we can take advantage of these tensor cores. And then on the left, comparison of what, what kind of speed ups are possible if you're willing to do mixed precision relative to FP32. And so the bottom curve here with these blue diamonds is uh, FP32 math. And you can see what kind of uh, level of teraflops per second that we can get here. 
And then as we go up, we're getting higher performance, taking advantage respectively of TF32 tensor cores, and then um, FP16 or BFLOAT16 tensor cores. And as you can see, a very large order of magnitude size improvement in performance if you can take advantage of mixed precision arithmetic. This is very commonly used to accelerate uh, deep learning training, but could also be relevant for um, certain HPC applications. So for example, today, if you download uh, QSolver, which comes as part of the CUDA toolkit and is NVIDIA's math library for solving you know, LAPAC-like um, opportunities, you know, like factorize a matrix and then iteratively uh, solve something like that. Um, we have built into QSolver the ability to do um, mixed precision arithmetic. And so you can accelerate um, solutions to linear systems even more by taking advantage of solving a, a, a guess at the solution in low precision and then iteratively refining it to the same precision that you would have gotten in FP64. And so we can get even higher uh, delivered performance on solutions to uh, those kinds of linear algebra problems uh, by taking advantage of that as well. And again, that just comes out of the box uh, when you download and use our tools. Another thing that's um, new in A100 uh, comes from the observation that when you train a neural network, um, often it turns out that many of the weights, uh, the trained weights in the neural network are um, zero or effectively close enough to zero that they don't um, add any meaningful amount of accuracy. And so what we can do is take advantage of that and just skip calculation of all of the um, zero values, right? And treat a dense matrix as a sparse matrix where all of the values that are sufficiently close to zero are just treated as zero and skipped. And in order to do this, we need to identify which parts of our matrix are in fact zero or, or sufficiently close to zero, and then build a, a map of that um, but once you've done that, then you can get up to a theoretical 2x performance improvement simply from we're just not calculating half the values, right? Uh, and so it's not like we are, um, there's no magic there, right? It's just recognizing that if you um, do inference on a neural network and then on the same neural network, but with the zero value skipped, then you'll get the answer 2x faster. And so that's how we can think of it as a 2x performance improvement. And so on real problems, comparing, uh, for example, inference on BERT large, you get a 50% uh, performance improvement in inference just by taking advantage of uh, some knowledge of sparsity. So it, it takes a little bit of work to use this, but uh, the benefits can be pretty substantial. Again, uh, this is primarily targeted at deep learning inference, um, and in that case can provide a pre pretty impressive speed up. Max, we have a couple of questions. Sure, go for it. So um, Marta is asking, what would be the acceleration if we compare it with the NVIDIA Tesla P100? Uh, okay, let me go back a second. So, you know, it's a little bit complicated to answer the question of what is the, the, the difference in performance because one thing that I want to emphasize is that um, you can't just read off the specs of these GPUs and then infer what the performance improvement would be. Um, because a lot of work is, goes in over time to just improving the applications themselves, both like the HPC applications and the DL applications. But I would say that um, relative to P100, um, it was about the same ratio from B100 to P100 as it is from A100 to V100 on most of these kinds of applications. So like this, there would have been a similar chart like this one comparing V100 to V100. And so if you compound that by, um, you know, a, a factor of, uh, the same factor, then you get a sense of it. In reality, I think it's actually even more than that. So if uh, we've done some studies of what application performance was on P100 in 2016, and then compared it to like average HPC application performance on, uh, B1, on A100 in uh, 2020, and it was a factor of like 10X um, uh, because of not just improvements in the hardware, but also substantial improvements in uh, application performance as well. And so, um, if you just look at the specs, that would be one thing, and that would lead you to like a you know um, two to three x type improvement. But uh, it could be substantially more than that, depending on if you're using an application that has been improved even more over time. Okay, so the next one is uh, uh, from my understanding, HSM can simultaneously schedule warps on the inter integer 32 and floating point 32 data paths at full throughput. Is that correct? 
And they also ask, uh, comparing the uh, Ampere GA102 SM, you can get two times FB32 operations per SM and warp because the integer 32 CUDA cores can do floating point 32 instead. Why is that possible in that architecture but not in GA uh, in GA100? Um, I will answer the first question and say that um, when we, let me think about how to answer this. Um, the answer to that is yes, the first question. However, I want to be careful because there's a difference between what the architecture can theoretically do and what you as an application programmer can realistically do. So the way that NVIDIA GPUs work, and, I, and this is really how any modern GPU works, is that you can have instruct different kinds of instructions going from different warps at the same time, where warp is a group of threads that execute together. And so in principle, one can write an application where some warps are doing standard FMA arithmetic, and then some other warps are doing um, tensor core arithmetic. And those two could be happening at the, at the same time in principle. However, I'm not really aware of any applications that can meaningfully take, do this, right, and get realistic throughput because there's the, there's what the uh, the GPU can theoretically do, and then there's the the realistic uh, limitation of can you actually get you know data into the SMs at a rate high enough to feed both of these things at the same time? And the answer is realistically no. I don't think that that's ever been achieved or could be achieved. And so um, another limitation is that when you're using tensor cores. The way that we write the tensor core instructions, at least in the, the C API, is that um, a warp works together to solve a tensor core problem. And so a consequence of that is that um, you can't, at one given instruction, be issuing both tensor core and FMA instructions. And so that also limits the ability to do both of these things at the same time to, like I said, the, the case where some parts of your, some warps are doing one thing and some are doing another, but it is hard extremely hard to actually do that in practice, I would, I would say. Um, I don't feel comfortable answering the question about the difference between this GPU and the uh, GA102 architecture. However, if you talk to me offline, I can get into that a little bit and, and discuss that with you. Yes. Uh, so another question is, uh, does the batch uh, gem also makes use of the tensor core for the FP64 inside Cubeless? And do they show the same speed up as you showed uh, for the big ma matrix gem case? So yes, the, um, uh, where did I put that? Yes, uh, we can do tensor cores um, for batch gems uh, as well as single gems. However, you know, most of the time, people use batch gems in cases where they are trying to solve, like each individual gem is too small to take advantage, to get full throughput. And so whether or not you get um, the full throughput of the tensor cores really depends on whether the size of your batch problem is large enough to do so, right? But in principle, um, a batch problem that uh, has the same size put together across all of the batches as uh, a single large gem of the same size should get about similar performance uh, in the two cases. Does that make sense? Thanks. So we have two more questions, and after that, I am going to let you to continue. So we have um, uh, so another question is: Could you comment on power efficiency relative to the V100? Yes. Um, one of the things that I was going to talk about in a moment is. Um, what some things that we've done to improve power efficiency um, on A100. So maybe I can answer that in my slides that are coming up. Yeah, that's a good idea. Okay, so the last one is, is it correct that the number of zeros increase as the training progresses? If so, is there a good uh, heuristic or on when to change the matrix from a dense or to a sparse format? For example, a certain ratio for density. What happens when zero value turn to non-zero values at the later iterations, or this valid only for the inference task? Right, that's a good question. And that's, I think, one reason why we've had not so many people, not so much success using this sparsity and training. It ends up being pretty hard for the reason that I think you're asking, which is that, um, you know, when you're doing training, there can be cases where a given value is zero at one stage in training and then non-zero later. And if you fix it to zero at one stage of training, it could change later and therefore makes it harder for you to, to do the training and, and be 
without constraining yourself into getting a lower accuracy answer. So for the most part, uh, this sparsity has been mostly applied to inference, uh, partially for that reason today. Thanks. Um, I'll let you to continue, and I probably won't interrupt you for much longer. Okay. Well, I'm happy to take questions because that's what I'm here for. But let me say a few words about what we did in A100 relative to V100 and other previous GPUs to improve strong scaling capacity. And I'll talk about how we improved um, performance uh, and efficiency. So you can break up a GPU um, into different levels of hierarchy, right? You can at the at the top level here we have the actual like math calculation, uh, and then the actual math op operations are done on data in a register file. That register file is often fed either from shared memory or the L1 cache. Uh, then that data within this is all happening within an SM, and then the GPU memory, the L2 cache, and the DRAM work together to feed those SMs. And then you could also have NVLink on multi GPU systems feeding data in together to get to the SM. So let me talk about some improvements at various levels of this hierarchy. So first I'll say something about um, how we improved tensor core efficiency and got effectively a 2x throughput relative to V100. So the central insight for um, any sort of matrix multiplication um, algorithm is that the more that you can share operands and reuse data, the more efficient you will be, right? And so that's the insight that goes through why efficient matrix multiplication algorithms do like blocking or tiling style algorithms on CPUs because the more data that you can reuse, the better. So if you compare um, a single precision floating point FMA um, on, for example, V100 or A100, then the way that you solve this problem is by having 32 threads individually do 32 floating point um, multiply nads, right? And so that's a standard FMA instruction on a GPU. Now on V100, the way that we did tensor cores is that we had groups of eight threads take relatively small chunks of a matrix and then combine them together to solve a larger problem, like an eight by eight by four matrix multiply. And so uh, the end result was that um, we could do um, 1024 multiply and accumulate instructions in eight cycles compared to, uh, for example, 32 and two. And so you can do the math and see that tensor cores got you a substantial improvement relative to FMA. In A100, the insight that we had was that, well, you can follow that same trend, right? The more you can share operands, the more you will reuse data and therefore the more efficient you will be. And so on A100 relative to V100, we um, took our tensor cores and had 32 threads share data instead of four individual groups of eight threads. Um, they work on, a, of course, a larger problem to solve together, but the end result is that you get more data reuse. And so if you then compare a, an example of a 16 by 16 uh, by 16 matrix multiply, um, what you end up getting is a 2x improvement in the actual throughput um, measured in terms of like how many cycles it takes to solve this problem but an even larger improvement in efficiency, right? Because we need fewer registers, uh, fewer hardware instructions to solve the problem. And so that's how we end up getting a substantial improvement in power efficiency by, uh, for, for example, for tensor core operations, by um, combining data across multiple, more threads in a warp to solve the problem together. And the end result is that you get substantial improvements relative to um, uh, FMAs. Now, um, I'm not gonna go into this in any more detail than I just did, um, but there is a, a great talk. In fact, I borrowed these slides from a great talk at uh, GCC 2020 um, that introduced A100 that I can refer you to if you want more detail on this. <clears throat> now, um, going up the chain a little bit, how do we get data to the register files so that we can uh, compute math on it? Well, what we noticed um, was an inefficiency in our previous architectures was that um, because we had uh, eight threads, uh, groups of eight threads working together to solve tensor core problems. That meant that we had um, uh, multiple uh, load instructions from shared memory. And so we were able to decrease the number of load instructions for feeding tensor cores on uh, A100. Additionally, one improvement that's um, generally useful is that we noticed, or one thing that you may have noticed if you're a CUDA programmer, is that the way that you would put data into shared memory on a GPU traditionally is that you would have a, a, a thread issue an instruction, which would then get data from DRAM, move through the cache hierarchy, bring it to the register file, and then copy it back to shared memory, and then later you would reuse it. But there's an inefficiency here, right? It would be great if we could just move data directly from L2 cache to shared memory uh, without having to 
take away uh, both uh, spots in our registry file and also valuable cycles that could be used for doing other work. And so in A100, we introduced a, a new instruction that allows you to load from global memory directly and store it into shared memory. Um, and this is done asynchronously, which means that uh, we are able to um, free up uh, L1 and register file resources uh, for other operations that can occur at the same time. And so it ends up being a more efficient use of resources and a uh, fewer total number of memory operations to solve this problem. And so this is one of the key insights that allows us to um, improve the, the rate at which, for example, tensor cores are fed. Now, um, again, if you want to keep tensor cores fed, they, they're very data um, demanding. And so one thing that you need to do is ensure that they're coming uh, from L2 cache fast enough. Now, when we're processing a neural network, for example, um, and we way that we typically do it is we take uh, a given section of a layer and then we distribute it across multiple SMs, right? And that's true for any kind of workload. You parallelize different tiles of your work across SMs. Now, um, on V100, uh, we had 80 SMs, and uh, this was some of the stats about how we uh, could deliver data from L2 cache. And the end result was that for relatively small tiles, um, what would happen is that you'd uh, um, basically saturate, fully saturate uh, L2 bandwidth to keep the tensor core spread. Because the way that um, matrix multiplications work, right, as I was kind of describing, is that the larger the matrix multiply is, the more compute bound it is, and the smaller it is, the more bandwidth bound it is. And so in order to keep the tensor cores going at full bandwidth, smaller tiles require a higher bandwidth usage. And so the end result was that for small tiles, we'd be basically, for a small tile, saturating L2 bandwidth. So if we imagined a hypothetical V100++, which had the same number of SMs as A100 does, and the same tensor cores as, as A100 does, uh, but without changing the importance of, of the memory subsystem, then we would be drastically over um, subscribing L2 cache. We would not be able to keep the tensor cores fed, and so they wouldn't achieve their peak performance. So in an A100, what we did is we both um, improved, doubled the throughput of the number of clocks per L2 slice, and also increased the number of L2 slices, so that you could stay within bounds of what bandwidth you need to deliver to keep the A100 tensor cores fed, and the end result is a much um, higher capability of saturating tensor cores. Um, now, obviously, it's not easy to um, just double the L2 throughput. So there were various architectural improvements that went into that. And one of the things that we did was that we um, basically split L2 cache into two uh, segments so that uh, the each segment of L2 cache is uh, feeding the SMs that are closer to it you know, on the, on the chip. And so we've demonstrated that here in the figure. And the result is that uh, we can get substantially higher throughput without sacrificing uh, cache coherence, of course, which is a, is a key thing that we need to do. Going further down to DRAM bandwidth, uh, what we see is basically a 1.7x improvement relative to V100 and um, a almost 7x larger L2 cache uh, relative to V100. And I mentioned that that's pretty important for many HPC workloads with large working sets. Another thing that we added to A100 that is new is the ability to um, play some role in determining which data is, stays resident in L2. That'll, of course, allow you to decrease your um, reliance on DRAM because the more the data can stay in L2 and reuse it, the higher the effective bandwidth that you will achieve in the application does. And so you can consult um, the CUDA programming guide if you want some information on how to take advantage of this. We also doubled the number of links coming uh, off, uh, MV links coming off the A100 relative to the V100. So the end result is that we can deliver um, up to 600 gigabytes a second um, bidirectional uh, across the, um, from one GPU to other GPUs. And that's pretty important for many workloads that um, re 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 require high bandwidth to and from other GPUs. Uh, of course, deep learning is an, ex an example of that and one of the things that drive this where you have large all reduce operations, but uh, obviously, this is relevant also for um, HPC applications where you have, for example, CUDA aware MPI. The higher bandwidth between GPUs is extremely relevant. Um, another thing that we did in A100 is that, you know, and, and you, this is based something you maybe have thinking about as you've been working on your applications from A100 to A100, is that the um, uh, strong scaling of your application eventually will reach limits where 
things that aren't compute like launching kernels can become important factors in your overall application latency. And so one thing that we've done is uh, in A100 work to improve uh, CUDA graphs where CUDA graphs are technology that allow you to join um, repeated uh, workflows, for example, launching N kernels in a row, rather than going back to the CPU, starting launching a new kernel, which has some overhead and then going back to the GPU, you can join that into one operation if that operation will be happening multiple times, you can join that into a graph and then execute that graph instead of executing kernels one by one. And that results in some pretty important improvements for uh, applications that have strong scale to the point where this kind of latency is relevant. And so if you then summarize this over V100, uh, I've listed some of the improvements here, um, you know, ranging from two to three X in many cases, both in capacity and also effective bandwidth achieved by taking advantage of some of these new architectural improvements. Uh, this is a good place to stop if we have any other questions before I finish with the last section of the talk. Let's see. Um, hey, two questions. Um, one is like there were two uh, TC per SME partition in G1, GV100. Unlike in Ampere, does HTC get only 2x of those eight thread groups in the Volta or all of the 4x? I'm, I'm actually not sure that I understand the question, so I'd want to take that offline. I guess what I can say is, is my point that we are, the way we changed the way that this is working so that you are operating on 32 thread groups instead of eight thread groups. And so that does change kind of the way that we map things to tensor cores. But if you have more details on that, just email me offline. I'm happy to discuss. Yeah, and the other question is about the slides, and the answer is yes, they, it will be available. We will uh, put it online on our website, uh, but uh, that will be after the talk. Okay. Is that it? Yep. Okay. So let me close with a few more thoughts about what's new on A100. So I mentioned that we have this new multi-instant GPU functionality. And so what is this about? Well, the idea is that um, we can split up the GPU into multiple instances, which are fully isolated from each other. Each instance has dedicated SMs, memory, uh, L2 cache requirements, um, L2 cache slices, uh, its own chunk of DRAM. And so that allows you to basically get a fully isolated chunk of the A100 GPU. And you can split up to seven of these uh, per A100. Each one of these has a guaranteed quality of service, right? Because you have fully isolated each slice relative to the other slices. It has its own section of compute resources. And the result is that um, work that's happening on the other GPU instances on, uh, on this GPU cannot interfere with work on that GPU instance because it's fully isolated in hardware. Um, you can choose your partitioning of your GPU to solve your problem. So if you need a, um, to solve a problem that is only, you know, only needs one seventh of the GPU resources, then you can split up your GPU into just one seventh of the GPU and then use that. But then maybe you need like two sevenths of the GPU and so you can configure um, a, a partition that uses two of the seven. And uh, this will allow you to support a wide range. Uh, this is time often used in, for example, deep learning inference where you would have multiple jobs going simultaneously. I will point out that um, there, uh, we are working hard in NVIDIA to make this kind of easy to use at uh, HPC centers. And so one of the things that we're working on is just building this directly into Slurm, for example, so that you can just natively split up a GPU, request an interactive allocation, and then get you know, a small chunk of the GPU for development purposes. And this is also something that we're working with both Argon and with Neurosk to uh, make available to users in kind of an easy way. And I think Argon already has some uh, a version of this today where you can take advantage of MIG uh, as well. Now, one of the um, new things that uh, is true on A100 relative to E100 with MIG is that on previous generations of GPUs, the way that you could partition a GPU was logical with the multi-process service. This allowed you to set up a daemon, essentially, <clears throat> that created servers on each GPU, and the server would handle work for multiple processes talking to the same GPU, and then logically split them across the SMs and other resources on the GPU. Um, but the, the issue there is that because this is happening dynamically and in software, uh, the result is that you can have contention for GPU resources. 
And that could be relevant for applications that really want to enforce that each process gets a specific level of, of uh, hardware resources. And so with multi-instance GPU, then you can directly enforce that because every GPU instance, no matter how many slices of the GPU it has, um, is fully isolated and just works at the, at the speed of that set of slices. And so that allows you to get uh, a more uh, guaranteed quality of service compared to multi-process service, which isn't really designed to enforce that uh, at the hardware level. And so if you compare the different kinds of concurrency mechanisms that are available to you, what you find is that, um, and I'll, I'll just kind of leave this table here for you to look at, but one, I'll highlight a couple of things that I didn't say yet. One of them is that um, MPS and MIG both allow you to have memory protection because we've isolated um, memory spaces, which for example, you would not get uh, just using normal CUDA streams. But one thing that's different with MIG and MPS is that um, errors that occur on one process uh, on MIG don't have to bring down all of the other um, uh, processes running on the GPU, whereas many errors like um, illegal memory access errors on one process uh, can bring down the entire, all processes running on the GPU at that time when you're using MPS. And so the error isolation can be useful, especially in cases where you have multiple users talking to the same GPU. Uh, the last thing that I'll say is that the, um, in touring and later GPUs, including A100, uh, one thing that we've added is the ability to get uh, sampling metrics of the GPU. And so the observation is the following. When you are profiling a GPU application, uh, and you use our tool insight systems to uh, collect data on that, you can get a very large amount of information uh, delivered to you. And in fact, sometimes that information can be um, overwhelming, right? Because you're getting basically every CUDA kernel launch that um, occurred and getting all of the um, memory copies, that sort of thing. And so that can almost combine into an overwhelming amount of information. Sometimes when you're trying to understand an application, especially for the first time, you just want to understand the answer to high level questions like at this point in my application, how effectively am I using the GPU? And so we've added the ability to sample uh, metrics in a kind of out of band sense that allows you to, at given uh, sample slices in time, query the GPU and ask it, you know, how many of these SMs are, are active? What's the average load on these SMs? Um, what's the bandwidth usage to and from the GPU, that sort of thing. So you can get a, a high level sense of what the usage of your GPU is. And for many applications, especially like deep learning applications, this is pretty critical because it can be pretty challenging uh, the first time you use these tools to really dig in and understand what you need to do to improve your application performance. And so one thing we wanted to do was make it easier for you um, as the application developer to understand, you know, what parts of your uh, application at a glance are using the GPU effectively and what parts aren't. And these new metrics that we've added to ENSA systems allow that. And I've um, listed some examples of metrics here that we have here for both utilization of the SMs and also IO uh, throughput metrics that you can understand performance on the GPU. And this again is available starting in uh, A100 uh, within the uh, HPC GPU classes. So it'll be available to you already on the GPU and soon on Prometer. Okay, I believe that's all that I had planned to say about A100. Um, so I'm happy to take any other questions that we might have. Thank you, Max. I think we have another question that is asking, if you want more than seven partitions, can we combine MIG and MPS on A100? Yes, it is possible to um, use MPS and MIG together so that you could, for example, have a MIG instance that is one seventh of the GPU, but also have multiple processes talking to that um, one uh, APU instance. That's right. With MPS. Okay, another question is how does COCOS perform on the um, A100 GPU? COCOS is, of course, a uh, performance portability framework. And so, you know, answering how COCOS performs on anything is, is kind of an ill formed um, question. But I will say that. Um, we have worked hard to ensure that the um, 
speed ups that we're talking about kind of just work out of the box and don't require for the most part any new performance applications. And so if you take an application that worked well on V100 and then recompile and run on A100, I would expect that to get a speed up regardless of whether you're using Cocos or Raja or OpenACC, right? Just you should get uh, that 1.7x memory bandwidth improvement or you know the, the out of the box um, FP64 improvement if you're compute bound. And there has been a lot of work by the Cocos community to ensure that um, applications running on A100 today do work well. So while I can't answer how does Cocos perform, I can say that um, for the applications that use Cocos today and have already gone from V100 to A100, they get you know kind of the speed ups you'd expect based on uh, the relative performance improvements between the two GPUs. Thank you. Um, if there are any questions, you're more than welcome to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi, am I audible? Yes. Um, okay. Uh, this is not really relevant to this particular talk, but I just wanted to ask the speaker um, about uh, essentially um, what are the opportunities for a physics PhD student, uh, specifically say in astrophysics, um, to uh, get uh, appointments simultaneously in academia and industry uh, like the speaker has. Um, especially say in hardware? Well, um, I will say that we, um, a number of people who um, work at NVIDIA and also other vendors, right? This is not specific to NVIDIA, um, work closely with um, academia or uh, like the US research community. And as a result, you know, have kind of informal or formal collaborations in various ways. And so, um, you know, a lot of the people who uh, work on my team at NVIDIA um, in the solutions architecture team, you know, come from academia or, or, you know, research labs themselves and have deep ties to that community. And so that informs a lot of the work that we do, right? You know, my job at NVIDIA is to work with the DOE uh, folks like you on uh, improving application performance. And so I come from that community and I like working with that community. And part of the way that I spend my time is, is doing that sort of thing. And so, um, well, I can't give anybody, you know, a generic answer to how do you get a job doing X, I can say that um, those of us who work in this space, um, just working with academia and the research community, is kind of a natural part of what we do. Thank you very much. Are there any more questions? If not, I would like to thank Max again for his presentation and audience for attending and asking questions. We will be providing the slides and the video uh, slides sooner, but the video later, but we will provide both of them in our website. Um, thank you, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.